Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. Um, if you didn't read my article from last week, it was published in the Africa Report, Debt, Virus and Locusts Create a Perfect Storm for Africa. And I think we're now seeing a lot of economists catch up with what I was saying there. This is um, uh, um, um, an exogenous risk in many respects, which I think is being uh, totally underestimated, that being the virus, and I'll get to that in a moment, debt, which was blinking amber uh, before we sleepwalked into this, and uh, on the eastern side of Africa we have this locust invasion which could go 500x um, if the weather system uh, works in its favour, and all indications are that the weather system will. Macro thoughts, uh, my partner's telling me I've become very obsessive, but I, the reason I'm obsessive about this coronavirus business is, is it's the year of the virus. It's the single most important event that has struck us for you know, a huge period. And just because we're in, in terms of the optics, the numbers aren't as dramatic, they are going to be all, uh, they're going to be so dramatic in such a short space of time. So confirmed cases have topped 110,000, recoveries near 70,000, deaths are over 4,000. That's from David Inglis. And indeed, that viral moment has arrived. Now, uh, let's just touch on some interesting macro developments because we've had some extraordinary uh, uh, movements in the market. Friday, March 6, 2020 was the best total return day ever in the US bond market, up 8.5%. That's Bianco Research. Monday, March 9, 2020 was the third best ever up 6.72%. So what comes after the first and third best days ever? Of course, the worst day ever. Tuesday, March 10, minus 6.66%. The bond freak asks, what the hell is really going on out there? Overnight repo hits what I presume to be the highest ever, including during the GFC. Um, would I be off target to say this is a bit concerning? What the hell is going on, he asks. And this is typical of massive stress in the markets. Um, Gita Gopinath, the chief economist at the IMF, has written a really interesting uh, response uh, to what is happening, limiting the economic fallout of the coronavirus with large targeted policies. This health crisis, and I like those opening words because that is what it is, will have a significant economic fallout reflecting shocks to supply and demand, different from past crises. Substantial targeted policies are needed to support the economy through the epidemic, keeping intact the web of economic and financial relationships between workers and businesses, lenders and borrowers, and suppliers and end users for activity to recover once the outbreak fades. And my concern is that a lot of people have got a V-shaped recovery in activity and I think the risk of second round infections or a mutation of the virus is very, very high. The first priority is clearly to keep people as healthy and safe as possible. Countries can help by spending more to boost their health systems including on personal protective equipment, screening, diagnostic tests, and additional hospital beds. And we'll develop on that further. That really is the first line of response. Tax cuts, rate cuts are all irrelevant um, in many respects. While the drop in manufacturing is comparable to the start of the global financial crisis, 
the decline in services appears larger this time, reflecting the large impact of social distancing. The global supply and demand for dry bulk shipping stocks, such as building materials and commodities, has also dropped, similar to during the most acute phase of the global financial crisis. Supply and demand shocks the coronavirus epidemic involves both a supply and a demand shock. Even larger effect on economic activity occurs because of efforts to contain the spread of the disease through lockdowns and quarantines, which lead to a drop in capacity utilization. Disruption is already having knock-on effects to downstream firms. Together, these disruptions contribute to a rise in business costs and constitute a negative productivity shock reducing economic activity. On the demand side, the loss of income, fear of contagion and heightened uncertainty will make people spend less. Workers may be laid off as firms are unable to pay their salaries. These effects can be particularly severe on some sectors such as tourism and hospitality, as seen, for example, in Italy. Since the start of the recent US equity market sell-off, on February 20, airline stocks have been hit disproportionately in line with the post-9-11 terrorist attacks, but lower than after the global financial crisis. A reduction of credit could amplify the downturn arising from the supply and demand shocks. Countries reliant <clears throat> on external financing could find themselves at risk of sudden stops and disorderly market conditions, possibly requiring foreign exchange intervention or temporary capital flow measures. Considering that the economic fallout reflects particularly acute shocks in specific sectors, policymakers will need to implement substantial targeted fiscal, monetary and financial market measures to help affected households and businesses. Korea has introduced wage subsidies for small merchants and increased allowances for home care and job seekers, and China has temporarily waived social security contributions for businesses. Um, where paid sick or and family leave is not among standard benefits, government should consider funding it to allow unwell workers or their caregivers to stay home without fear of losing their jobs during the epidemic. Considering the epidemic's broad reach across many countries, the extensive broad cross-border economic linkages, as well as the large confidence effects impacting economic activity and finance and commodity markets, the argument for a coordinated international response is clear. That, I thought, was a very precise response to the exponential multiplicative nature of the coronavirus by the IMF's Gopinath. Um, and I had been complaining that our policymakers had been far too linear in their response to date. So that's, uh, I would say, somebody who's ahead of the curve and thinking about it correctly. Um, as I wrote on the 24th of Feb, the viral moment has indeed arrived. Um, I like this tweet from Order Flow Trader of what it must look like to be a trader right now. In oil, there are economics and there are egonomics, said P Petro Matrix. And uh, we're currently, we've rebounded pretty substantially with $35.07 on WTI. And as I said yesterday, I think this is like a theater where MBS and Putin are pretending to be in a fight but they're really knifing the U.S. shale sector. And the enemy is the U.S. shale sector, and the fight is not between those two apparent protagonists. Kyle Bass agrees with me as well, and he gave it a much fruitier turn of phrase and said the Saudis have flown the equivalent of an aeroplane uh, like 9-11 into the U.S. shale sector. 
Um, I, I noticed Rover829 would personally be interested to see subscriber numbers for streaming services such as Disney, Netflix, Hulu this year, especially in countries where hard quarantines or school closures are being announced. And I think Netflix is a way to uh, inoculate your portfolio. <clears throat> Home Thoughts, Lamu Dao Race 2020. This video is from Margot Kaiser. It's rather fantastic and I don't know how she's done it. Maybe she had a drone. Um, Lamu is an extraordinary place to visit. I haven't been there for a number of years and I must uh, go back. Political reflections. I couldn't resist this and I can't pronounce <coughs> the Spanish Anos expliquenle que significa lucha por la tierra. And I particularly like the groove that the older man is showing. How Turkey lost a battle of wills and force to Russia. When the history of the Syrian conflict is written, the fighting that took place between the Syrian army and its allies on the one side and the Turkish military and Turkish-backed Syrian rebels on the other from early February through early March 2020 in and around the Syrian town of Sarakib will go down as one of the decisive encounters of that war. Representing more than a clash of arms between the Syrian and Turkish militaries, the battle for Sarakib was a test of political will between Turkish President Recep Erdogan and his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin. History will show Turkey lost on both accounts. Um, and indeed they have. And I think the lesson to draw here is that given Putin's commitment to Assad and Syria, given the uh, warm water port uh, deal he did at Latakia, He's got more skin in the game than Erdogan. And have a look at this. Russian TV runs footage showing how Putin made Turkey's President Erdogan wait in frustration and the Kremlin before greeting him while cameras were rolling. And I think, as I concluded, Erdogan is in a Putin rat trap. And indeed, as I wrote in October 2015, Putin is a geopolitical grandmaster. And actually, he has the least ego, I think, of world leaders. Compare him to any other world leader you care to mention. They're all narcissists. And he has the least, and he's actually dealing from a position of strength. Interesting point Yishan makes, March 9. So Silicon Valley saw a superior near parity technological society grapple with the mortal threat and barely manage to face it down. And I've been thinking about this, you know, where was the signals intelligence about what was happening in China? Maybe Bill Gates had it because he was quite prescient in October. <coughs> Yishan again, so Silicon Valley saw a superior near parity technological society grapple with the mortal threat and barely manage to face it down while the rest of the U.S. interpreted it through the old Cold War lens of lol, primitive authoritarian country has bad hospitals, won't happen here. Then another tweet, if that were the case, hedge fund guys in New York should have been making a killing on this the whole time, and we should have seen the market move way earlier, but we didn't. This is another point. Sure, Silicon Valley people are good at math or understand exponential growth better. But if that were the case, hedge fund guys in New York should have been making a killing. And I responded by saying, very interesting point, Yishan. And what is clear to me is that a lot of hedge fund guys do not understand the exponential function. And that they are in an intellectual bunker. A little bit like Trump. And I came across this article in The Independent, Trump's ability to continue to live in his alternative reality 
and resist the need to conform to the world is creating a crisis for him. And he managed to make the world conform to his reality via OTT broadcasting and all of that. But he cannot make the virus conform. And therefore, I think hindsight will show this was a Shakespeare-level problem. In the image below, after 20 levels of transmission, one sees that the common flu would progress to infect 820 people versus 2.6 million for SARS-CoV-2. There is simply no comparison between both Moshe al-Joshi and that is ultimately the point that all the Berber, the flu people, fail to appreciate and still spout the same thing ad infinitum. The issue about whether it is a pandemic is now irrelevant or as Groucho Marx asked, who, who, Dr. Tedros, are you going to believe, Dr. Tedros or your own eyes? Daily update, 5,007 new coronavirus cases were reported, a record high, surpassing the peak of the epidemic in China, that's Zorina Q, excluding the artifact on 12 February when China changed the de case definition. Daily update, there are 1,126 coronavirus deaths outside mainland China, we observe an almost perfect exponential growth. Deaths are doubling every three days, or ten times every ten days. The US has performed five coronavirus tests per million people, compared with South Korea's 3,692 tests per million people. This is a 730x difference, Dr. Eric Ding. Bianco Research, the US crossed 1,000 cases tonight. Italy is at 10,000 today. Italy crossed 1,000 just 11 days ago. Their entire country is locked down. As I've been noting, we seem to be two to three weeks behind Italy. Maybe that is now one to two weeks. US chart, since it took off on February 20, doubling every three days, second degree polynomial projection, a fancy way of taking a ruler on a log chart and projecting out 10 days. If testing continues as promised, 25,000 cases in 10 days, what does this do to the national psyche? As I wrote previously, viruses exhibit non-linear and exponential characteristics. Xi Jinping uh, visited coronavirus patients, visiting as in inverted commas, at the Huo Shenshan Hospital in Wuhan. This photograph is by Anna Fifield. Before we move on, just compare that with President Trump shaking hands with hundreds of people in Florida. <clears throat> And what we're seeing, which is another interesting point, is the infection reaching the highest echelons of power. But not in China, because of these restrictions and this extraordinary optics of this photograph. The challenge for China, in my view, remains second round effect of infections. They can't put everybody back to work. Therefore, fantasy predictions of a V-shaped recovery in China, in my view, are dashed. Uh, in fact, China cannot just crank up the factory because that will risk a second round effect of infections. Z says the virus epidemic basically curbed at the epicenter. <clears throat> um, the cynics would say they've curbed it, but they've exported it everywhere in the world. Um, China's President Xi visits quarantined residents in Wuhan as coronavirus epicenter closes its 14 makeshift hospitals. Interestingly, a lot of folks are expressing the thought that it might be a body double. And I'm sure that can be definitively established, can't it, by face recognition technology. 
The big advantage China had was its uh, algorithmic control, which they had already tested in Xinjiang. Um, He's declaring China's victory over the coronavirus. Um, uh, uh, Karl Minzner expects tonight's 7 p.m. state news to present this in tones akin to a military victory, with Z as the victorious commander in chief. Of course, we don't know the whole story, but the optics of this moment is compelling. We don't know the whole story because we don't know the numbers. That's the point. And uh, there are lots of clues in the noise which indicate the numbers are substantially higher than what we're being told. 27th of May 2019, I was writing about how in one fell swoop, President Xi Jinping was president for life. And I said he's on a pedestal faced with a strongman conundrum and his political brand will not permit a retreat, let alone a surrender. It was interesting how the police went ahead of him in China and made sure that the streets and people in the apartments behaved themselves appropriately when he came. They didn't at a previous senior visit. Um, and then also when I was writing on the occasion of the 70th anniversary of the uh, uh, Chinese Communist Party, I said, you know, they were seeking to project a sense of inevitable forward motion a fulfillment of the promise that Mao Zedong made on the founding of the People's Republic of China on October 1, 1949, that China would stand up, that they have stood up. His model is one of technocratic authoritarianism, and a recent addition to his bookshelf included The Master Algorithm by Pedro Domingos, and that he's building an algorithmic society um, taken the propagation of ideology and the cult of personality to extremes not seen since the days of Chairman Mao. He's replaced Jesus in churches and Muhammad in the mosques. Unity is iron and steel. Unity is a source of strength. I concluded that article uh, in October 2019 not because I was predicting anything, but I said, you know, the world in the 21st century exhibits viral wildfire and exponential characteristics and feedback loops, which only become obvious in hindsight, and then look what happened. Xi Jinping's first stop in Wuhan fired God Mount Hospital state television. This is how China is dealing with deadly coronavirus. This is from Global Politics uh, video. It's quite extraordinary. Tinder became a new service about coronavirus, setting my Tinder to Wuhan so I can get the real scoop on what's going on. One user wrote, East Asians are not seeing the active case infection rate double every three days, but Europe, even Italy still, and the US are. That's from Charlie Robertson. And uh, it's a lot to do with how early you reacted. It's a lot to do with how many you tested and it's a lot to do with the demography of your population. Iran has far more coronavirus cases than it is letting on, that's the Atlantic. As of yesterday, according to John Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center, Iran has reported 6,566 COVID-19 cases, or about one in every 12,000 people in its population. First case appeared on February 19. Right now, Iran is third behind China, 80,695, and South Korea, 7,314, and just ahead of Italy, when this article was written, 5,883. First sign of dishonesty came on Feb 28, when Masume Ebtekar, one of the country's vice presidents, announced that she had the virus. Um, and then he's done a lot of analysis on a paper by the University of Toronto's Ashley Tweet and others noted that by February 23rd, cases of Iranian origin had surfaced in Canada, Lebanon and the UAE. Um, and that if you looked at the volume of air travel between Iran and these countries, the team estimated how many native COVID-19 cases must have occurred in Iran to produce one case each in these countries. Their estimate for February 23rd was 18,300. 
Since the epidemic reached 100 cumulative cases, the official numbers have doubled roughly every three days. If that rate held, the estimate as of today would be 586,000 cases. And then he's got more analysis, which puts the numbers above 2 million. And that takes me back to Hunter S. Thompson and his edge. There is no honest way to explain it, because the only people who really know where it is are the ones that have gone over. Iran has been at the edge for quite a while. Uh, for other reasons. More people die from car accidents than bear attacks. But if you saw a sleuth of bears, really, that's the name, running at you, you wouldn't say to the bear, cars kill more people. You'd take that time to attempt some social distancing maneuvers really fast. Let's go to the currency markets and have a look at that. Euro dollar 113.54, dollar index 95.971, Japanese yen 104.40, Swiss franc 0.9331, the pound uh, ooh, back below 129 at 129, Australian dollar 0 0.6503. India rupee 73.886, South Korean 111.96.96. Brazilian real 4.6442, Egyptian pound 15.72, South African rand 16.03. Dollar index, we traded much stronger at the beginning of the year. We then slumped and we might have turned around again. We're at 95.988. Euro dollar 113.53, trading more like a safe haven. Stock surged on Tuesday along with credit spreads not normal, says Tracy Alloway. Indeed, she's correct. And today, stock market in the Dow Jones is trading down 766 points. Gold has been a little bit disappointing of late. I would have expected us to be closer to 1700 by now. Um, as you know, I think we're headed to 2000. Um, I think it is the perfect um, hedge against what we're watching and witnessing. But it's being hit with bouts of uh, liquid liquidations as people reach from cash. Um, we're currently at 1666. We're going to wake up one day and it's going to be at 1750 and we'll be off to the races. So this is probably as good time as any to be buying it. Crude oil, which slumped below uh, 30 um, uh, on that Monday, um, Black Monday, uh, Black Gold, $34.60. Sub-Saharan Africa, Somalia, pirates hijack tanker laden with 2 million barrels of sanitizer gel. That's from RTN Somali TV. And I was kind of thinking to myself, uh, with oil so low, the sanitizer gel is probably worth more in the year of the virus than the black gold. As we've already discussed before, debt, virus and locusts create a perfect storm for Africa, uh, was that article I was writing. Um, and I was saying the virus is not correlated to endogenous market dynamics, but is an exogenous uncertainty that remains unresolved. And therefore, it is a black swan. Um, and I, I went through you know, the, the risks. I spoke about the countries which are in the line of fire. Um, Nigeria, where the currency is going to be devalued, whether they do it officially or whether the market does it to them is the open question, but nothing else. Um, uh, and I was talking about the locusts as well. Have a look. That link is on rich wrap-ups. Reports that DR Congo had its first COVID-19 case have been confirmed in Kinshasa. It's a Belgian but you will recall that the President Shishikedi was at the APAC conference in the United States where they've already identified a couple of cases. And that goes back to Epsilon Theory's very pithy uh, sentence, nothing, 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 cluster, 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 and then boom. A lot of folks in Africa were looking for the hotter weather or the genetic makeup of Africans to protect us from it. I think that's going to be proven wrong in the next few days. COVID-19 cases in Africa has reached 105, Egypt 59, Algeria 20, South Africa 7, 
Tunisia 5, Senegal 4, Morocco 3, Cameroon 2, Nigeria 2, Burkina Faso 1, Togo 1, DR Congo 1. And of course that um, Marine who was in Ethiopia, and that is the clue to Ethiopia where they've done 31 tests. Um, and if a Marine on some army base has got it, it means thousands have got it. South Africa isn't ready for the coronavirus at all. I've been through the whole process of arriving in South Africa through Oliver Tambo, as well as going into self-isolation due to a credible chance of infection. This is a very interesting tweet thread. Have a look at what he's saying, real underscore Stein, and you'll see why I'm paranoid about Africa, because we are past the point of no return now. Viruses do exhibit non-linear and exponential characteristics. Uh, COVID spread with associated severe caseload. We don't have the health infrastructure. Um, and uh, just to reiterate, Epsilon, nothing, 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 cluster, 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 and then boom. We had nothing, nothing, nothing. We're now in cluster, cluster, cluster. Um, 27th of January, I said, I have to assume that the coronavirus is already in Africa, but just not diagnosed. And I said, it's a racing certainty, and it's going to be like what we've seen in Iran. South African all shares down 13.35% year to date. I've written previously about the China emerging markets frontier feedback loop phenomenon. Um, the fallout is being experienced in the first world as well in Germany because of the trade interconnection. But the RAND is the purest proxy for this phenomenon. That's why we're above 16 and going lower. Egyptian pound 15.70, EGX 30 down 19.78%. Nigerian all share down 9.14%. Ghana down 3.09%. To show you that it's not just the first world that's suffering from the China situation, imports from China fell by 36.6% in the first two months of 2020 over the coronavirus. Exports similarly affected, that's Kepsa. Tallow Oil are demanding $2 billion of compensation. Uh, this is absolute madness, says Ndungu Wainaina. The question is, on what basis are they demanding that? If they have a legal basis, then we've got uh, uh, further questions to ask. In the papers, Kenya's fourth largest bank, Co-op Bank, is to acquire 100% of Jamie Bora Bank. Uh, Nairobi all shares down 10.66% year-to-date. The NSC20 is down 12.92% year-to-date. Thank you for listening.